Greetings and welcome back to Old Ways Rising Farm where we're once again talking about making some stuff. In this case, leather. Today I'm making a chalk talk video on leather making broadly defined. So I am a firm believer in the idea that food is sacred, that when we take an animal's life for food, we need to use absolutely everything that we can, including hide bone sinew and every every scrap of useful material needs to be used to respect the gift that is the food that we eat okay now leather is something that everybody has touched and felled and you maybe even made something out of but the process of making the skin into the leather sort of has a mystique around it that i don't believe it really deserves okay there's this idea that this is the sort of like an out there special arcane knowledge if you will being a little silly but the <laughs> in terms of you know taking the you know taking the skin after you after you're done butchering and turning it into a well preserved useful product it doesn't need to be that way this is just simple simple chemistry and biology there's only a few different things that you can do to a hide in the process of preserving it that will have three or four different effects. And all of the diversity of these tanning formulas and methods and different ways of going about it are really just a whole bunch of different ways of doing the same thing. But because they are different processes, there will be some differences in the, the characteristics of the final product. So this video is about demystifying all of that. I'm going to take you through the biology, the chemistry, and the history of all of these different methods, compare them to each other, so that if you are interested in tanning some of your own hides, you will have the information to go forth and pick the best method for your skill set, available resources, space, time, etc., and the desired final product that you wish to come out with. This is not a strict tutorial on how to execute these methods. It's about understanding these methods. There are a series of tutorials already up on the channel. I will put a link to that playlist at the end of this video, and many more are coming. But some of these methods take quite a long time to execute, so they'll you know, dribble through here as we go forward and, and the channel evolves. So I hope that that is of interest to you and let's dig into some of the details of what skin actually is. Welcome to the skin. This is a very important organ on every animal and you're thinking, thank you, Captain Obvious. But we need to talk about the biology of skin so that we can understand the purpose of the various steps in a leather tanning process. Um, there's obviously a whole lot more going on here than just a couple of individual things that I've shown on the board, but we're not going to go into that. We're not talking about nerve endings and glands and all of the other stuff that goes into a living organ. We're just talking about the stuff that we need to think about in terms of choosing a leather making process. Okay? This is a simplified version. Um, Ignoring the hair follicles for the time being, you have three basic layers that we need to talk about. The upper layer is the waterproofing layer, the epidermis. Okay? The epidermis is about 90% keratinocytes, and they produce the protein keratin, which also is the protein that hairs are made out of and is very abundant in the hair follicle as well. Okay? Now, going on down, you have the bottom of the epidermis is called the basement membrane. Below the basement membrane, you have the dermis. The dermis is primarily made out of two things. The first is a basically a felt. These are fibers going every which direction at complete random. And they are made out of uh, protein, again. Okay, this is collagen and elastin fibers. The protein is the same protein that is in sinew, they're just in sinew, it's long linear proteins, and it's the same protein that we break down by cooking to produce gelatin and hide glue. I also have a hide glue video up on this channel. Um, so 
we have those, as you know from gelatin and hide glue, as they dry down, it becomes very, very hard and stiff. Okay, So that's part of why rawhide, when you just dry it down, has all of the softness of a chunk of plywood, right? Is because this is hard material to begin with. In life, it's full of water, and that water allows the, the fibers to be flexible and to move past each other. And to restrict that movement so it acts as a nice elastic matrix for all of the other stuff in the living organ that is skin, um, you have what's called ground substance. Ground substance is basically a type of mucus, really. It is made of two things. You have long chain polysaccharides. Polysaccharides are just a whole bunch of sugar molecules in a string. And you have glycoproteins. Glycoproteins are a protein, just like the collagen and elastin fibers are protein, but they're modified by having a sugar or multiple sugars stuck on various positions along the length of the protein fiber. Okay, So we have sugars and sugary proteins. Well, what do you know about wet sugar? It is sticky. So this is the glue which goes out and it sticks to the different protein fibers and holds them together. But because it's a very watery glue, it remains flexible. Okay, But as you dry this down, again, if you've done any woodwork or sinew work or anything with hide glue, you'll know it shrinks dramatically. Okay, So this mucousy glue, as your raw hide dries, it shrinks and it pulls these fibers even closer together and locks them into an even, hider, even harder, if I could talk, sheet of plywood. <laughs> okay? So if you just take the hide and dry it down and keep it dry, keep it bug free, it will preserve. It won't rot. But you don't want to go make a fur hat out of such a thing because plywood is not comfortable on your head. So we want to be able to manipulate this so that we can create a new material which will dry down, remain soft and supple, and perform what other whatever things that we want to do with it, right? Now, the first thing we want to think about is where the strength comes from. The strength comes from the dermis. So this is not to scale. And no matter how I draw these two thicknesses, it will vary at different places in a hide. The epidermis is pretty consistent. It's just a waterproofing membrane, really. Okay? This is what hide tanners call the grain. Right? Top grain cowhide has the grain left on. It's the shiny surface on belt leather. Okay? That's the epidermis. Um, fur skins have this left on. Anything that you want to be a real soft, supple, um, velvety, smooth, suede type material, you take this off. Okay, But in the process of taking this off, you'll also lose all the hair. So your fur skins, it has to stay on. The strength, though, comes from the dermis and all of these collagen and elastin fibers. That's what gives you strength in belt leather and strap leather and you know machinery belts and harness leather and all of that. The strength comes from the dermis, not from the epidermis. The epidermis is just a surface coating. So as hide gets thicker, the only reason an animal is going to grow a thicker hide is because it wants more strength. So it gets thicker in the dermis layer, not in the epidermis. Okay. Because the epidermis is keratinized and the dermis is not, they will behave differently. Keratin is degraded by basic solutions and shrunk and preserved by acidic solutions. This is where you get your bucking and your pickling steps in high tanning. If you want to preserve the hair, you need to preserve the keratin. You put it in an acidic solution that preserves it and it also shrinks it. So you can see here where this hair follicle goes through the epidermis, that's just gonna shrink and lock up on the hair follicle. Also, it will shrink the, you know, down here and grab onto that bulb at the base of the hair. 
So the follicle, the little tube coming up from the follicle and the epidermis above it is just going to latch onto that hair and not let go. That's what happens when you put it in a pickle. If you put it in a basic solution, you do the opposite. First, it swells the keratinized tissue so that the hair can release from the follicle easier. This is how you dehair it. And then if you allow it to remain in a basic solution for a sufficient length of time, the um, epidermis will swell and become so weak that it can easily be scraped away. Okay, That's called bucking, putting this hide in a basic solution or allowing bacterial action to accomplish the same goal. We'll, we'll talk about that in the next clip of this video. Is bucking. Buckskin is a skin that has been bucked, not a skin that came from a deer. Okay? So chamois leather is also a bucked skin, even though you know it's traditionally made from you know mountain goats. I mean, well, kind of a goat. This this is not tax ta taxonomy video, so we're not going to go there. But um, vellum can be a bucked skin. Right? Often you'll do this on on vellum processing to help thin it down. So that's what we mean by buckskin. It is epidermis removed. That's the key characteristic. Okay? If you want a brain tanned deer hide bucked skin, you need to use all of those terms to indicate what you mean. <laughs> right? So that's the first thing. If we want hair or top grain leather, we want to be very careful to preserve this epidermis and do that with acid treatment. If you want dehaired top grain leather, you need to do a very careful controlled bucking step so that you can release the hair follicles but you don't degrade the epidermis and then immediately get it in acid, pickle it, and shrink it back down and preserve it. Okay. Then we get down here to the dermis, and this is the real leather, the real leather. We want to preserve these collagen and elastin fibers. Fortunately, they don't care whether they're in acid or base, they will be preserved. Okay? So either treatment preserves the real structure of the leather. That's good. And we need to, no matter what we do up here, we need to get rid of the ground substance. Fortunately as well, it is degraded by acid or base catalyzed hydrolysis. That means that a very small amount of acidity or basicity will weaken the chemical bonds that tie all of these sugary stuff together and allow water to come in and replace those bonds and break them. Okay. That happens in acidic or basic condition. So if we acid pickle a fur skin to preserve the fur, we are already degrading the ground substance. If we buck a skin to make a nice soft buck skin, we are also already degrading the ground substance. And because these are sugary, bacteria very much enjoy eating them. So again, if we're doing a controlled fermentation, to weaken the epidermis, we will still be removing the ground substance. So it's easy to get rid of, okay? And that's good. Um, then lastly, you need to preserve the collagen and elastin fibers. This is mordanting, very much like in, in the dye world. When you're doing using a natural dye, you have to put a mordant on it first. That comes in and it locks to the fibers, preserves the fibers, and then allows the colorant to come in and lock to the mordant. Right? So we have to have a mordant which will preserve the fibers and restore some degree of this cross-linking. Okay? If you don't restore the cross-linking, it will never be waterproof or water-resistant in any way. You get it even slightly damp, as soon as it dries out, hard, to, hard as a board again. Right? So you need some cross-linking in order to get it soft, get these fibers to fluff out, and then keep them fluffed. 
right? Um, the stronger the cross-linking agent, the more durable, but also the less soft the leather will be. So the weakest cross-linking agent we're going to talk about is formaldehyde, which only keeps them from returning to a hard condition. It only acts as a mordant and does very little else. Um, and gives you the softest, fluffiest leather. And veg tan or bark tan, where you're using tannic acid as the mordant and cross-linking agent, that gives you the hardest belt leather and harness leather. Okay, So that has to do with the strength of the cross-linking chemistry. Um, we're also going to do here, in a, in a little clip coming up fairly soon, a little chemical demonstration where I will show you this how this cross-linking looks on a small scale. Okay, But before we get to that, I want to talk about the preparatory steps of bucking and pickling. So I'm going to clear the board and I'll meet you right back here in a, in a couple seconds. Bucking and pickling. Again, just a reminder from the first board, bucking, we are trying to remove the hair if it's a short process and then eventually degrade and remove the epidermis. Pickling, we want to shrink the epidermis around the hair if we're doing a hair on skin or if we want a glossy surface hair off leather when you're done the short bucking step you will then pickle it in order to remove all of the basicity as quickly as humanly possible and shrink that epidermis back to its original form and thus preserve it for the rest of the thus preserve it for the rest of the the stuff that you're going to do to it okay also when you're done with bucking you have to get all of the base out of the solution um, OH minus is the ion which makes things basic. You can do that by soaking it in water and just remove all of those OHs by diffusion, or you can add a little bit of a pickle to rapidly neutralize them. And it shortens the time length that you need to neutralize your hide. Okay? Now, the uh, sources of these. Over here on the bucking side, we have two little outliers. Tradish, you can have a cold water soak. That is a very slow fermentation where you are allowing bacteria to degrade all of the glandular stuff that's in the hair follicle and thus release the hair. Okay? Rapidly in modern time, you'll hear people talk about sweating a hide by sticking it in a plastic bag. It's exactly the same idea as a cold water soak, but it requires a plastic bag, which is why I just separated these on tradish and modern, right? Plastic bags, modern. Tradish, bucket of cold water, but same idea. And that's the outlier here. It's the only one of these that we're doing exclusively with fermentation, and we don't have a chemical boost to the process. Okay? Now, tradish sources of hydroxide. One is urine. The urea in urine is um, two ammonia molecules cross-linked on a CO2. When that degrades, it releases ammonium back into water, which immediately <clears throat> produces ammonium hydroxide. There's a little bit of complexity in that chemistry. We're not going to go in there. There is a video where I talk about this process at some length. It is the salt-based fertilizers video. And I will put a little link at the top of the screen here if you want to go and uh, check that out at a later time. Um, for now, when you talk about you're using urine in a tanning process, it's a source of hydroxide, the source of the ammonium hydroxide. Okay? This is common still. This is still used in the Moroccan leather tanning process. That's where it comes in. Um, wood ashes are a source of potassium hydroxide. And this is kind of the old, everywhere accessible farmer's method, putting wood ashes in water and soaking a hide in it. This can get too concentrated, so you have to watch it. You've got to make sure you don't put too much wood ash, or you will just hydrolyze everything and you will end up with Swiss cheese and not leather. Fine. Fine, yeah. Not fine. fine. You're allowed to talk on <laughs> Hydrated live. You don't have to whisper. They know you're back there. Hydrated lime, calcium hydroxide. Um, this is burnt limestone. 
So again, this is an ancient process that comes in anywhere that you have limestone deposits. Burn it, it turns into a powder, throw that powder. That powder is quicklime, calcium oxide, you throw it in water, it generates calcium hydroxide. This is what I like to use for bucking hides because it is sparingly soluble. Lye in all of its forms is strongly soluble. So you can burn a hide to, to bits with wood ashes, but you really can't burn a hide to bits with hydrated lime. It won't dissolve at a high enough concentration to burn out your hide. So that's why I, I like this one over this one. Both work, both are traditional. Um, and then modern, I mentioned sweating already, but you just buying commercial lye is a common modern method. Could you extract the lye from sodium from uh, the potassium hydroxide from wood ashes historically and um, sell that as a crystal and then re reconstitute it as commercial lye? Yeah, but there's not really any evidence that that was a common thing. So this is sort of the traditional way to buck a hide with lye and just buying the uh, drain cleaner pellets is the modern way to buck a hide with lye. Again, I said wood ashes is dangerous for your hide. Commercial lye is even more dangerous for your hide, as well as for you. Do not do this unless you have the materials and resources to test the pH and make sure that your final pH is a precise predetermined amount. Okay. Don't just do this in your kitchen. You will, you're going to end up with Swiss cheese hides. Okay, it won't go well for you. Do one of these two. Hydrated lime is readily available and really cheap. You know, and it's it's almost impossible to screw up with it. Um, in terms of safety with this, you still need to be careful with it. It is still a caustic solution. It will strip all of the oils out of your hands very quickly. It will, um, it will degrade all keratinous material, which includes your epidermis, right? So given enough time, and it will degrade your skin. Actually, it, it, your, your fingernails are too dense. It won't dissolve in. Hmm. That's a density thing, not a chemical thing, right? The, uh, uh, what it will do to you is it will take a scab off almost instantaneously. Hmm. So if you have a cut on your hand with a scab on it, you stick it in there for a, under a minute. It will strip that scab right off, and now you'll have an open wound that is burning like fire. Don't Fun. ask me how I know. Um, so you definitely want to wear gloves on this, and you don't want to get it in your eyeballs. But it is safer than either wood ashes or commercial wood. Um, that's sources of material for bucking. Pickling. Again, your tradish is your vinegar, acetic acid, okay? Very benign. It'll burn if you get it in your eyes, but, you know, other, it's, it's food, right? Other than that, it's food, <laughs> okay? Don't get it in your eyeballs, but it, it's very, very safe. Now, could you buy or barter for finished vinegar in the old days? Of course you could, but it was expensive, so when you look to a lot of old time tanning processes, you will see instead of buying prepared vinegar, they will be actively fermenting either a grain mash or animal dung. Okay? And that active fermentation, for one, again, as I mentioned in the previous video, fermentation itself degrades the ground substance, so you have that benefit and it's producing vinegar as it ferments. You know, so I mentioned that, you know, like Moroccan tanning uses urea as a hydroxide source for the bucking stage. They also commonly still use pigeon <clears throat> dung fermenting in vats for the pickling stage, okay? So, you know, pigeon dung is a whole lot cheaper than imported high-quality balsamic vinegar. Obvious things are obvious. So you eat the good stuff and you let your hides ferment in the crap, literally. <laughs> I don't think YouTube will be mad at me for, for, for that one. Anyhow, the, uh, you know, those are kind of the traditional ways to pickle your hide. I like vinegar 
it's dirt cheap you know modern um, household cleaning vinegar is dirt cheap in current time and acetic acid evaporates so one of the things I like to do is get a whole bunch of stuff bucked at once and then I'll get it all delimed and neutralized at once give it a quick soak in water to get most of the vinegar out and then as it dries down you don't have to worry about the residual because it will evaporate out okay if you're just drying it back down to rawhide the store for later so that's why I like this kind of vinegar if you're doing an active fermentation process you're gonna ha you're gonna have to clean the ever-loving be jabbers out of it to get all of the dung and bacteria and get it resanitized mm -hmm. right, so I like this one now modern materials alum and friends Okay, this is a group of chemicals. We're going to talk more about this when we discuss cross-linking agents, because this comes into play there as well. Um, commercial food-grade pickling alum is straight aluminum sulfate with precisely 12 waters of hydration. That means for every unit of, of aluminum sulfate in the crystal, you have 12 waters in the crystal in a predictable arrangement. Okay? Non-food grade alum is basically the same thing, but you have aluminum sulfate. Sometimes you also have some potassium ions in there, and the number of waters hanging out in the crystal is not predictable. So it's just a less pure version of basically the same stuff. And then chromium-based processes use chromium alum, where you have chromium 3-plus ions replacing the aluminum 3-plus ions. We're going to, again, we're going to bump into both of these cross-linking agents, but they show up here as well, because all we care about is the sulfate. The sulfate ions, when mixed with water, generate trace amounts of sulfuric acid. Okay? Um, and that sulfuric acid then acts as a pickle, degrades the ground substance, and shrinks and preserves the epidermis. Okay? So I recently did a uh, alum tan on some deer hawk leathers, and I used the alum for both the pickling and the cross-linking at once. That's, that's why these are handy and are the quickest of all tanning processes, because you get, you get a twofer, two for one in terms of time investment. Um, then the commercial sulfuric acid, you could just buy sulfuric acid. Same warning as using commercial lye. Do not buy commercial sulfuric acid. It's battery acid. Um, you don't try to use this on a hide unless you have some chemical skill and training and you have the ability to test the pH to make sure you got it right. Or you are going to end up, again, it's another good way to end up with Swiss cheese instead of leather. And then commercial boric acid is used in some tanning processes. This is not as strong an acid as the commercial sulfuric acid, but I'm giving the same warning, right? Don't use this without some chemical training and skills so that you know you got it right. It's a lot less scary than the sulfuric acid, though. Now, I kind of drew it up arrow with a question mark because both sulfuric acid and boric acid were known to the ancients. The ancient Mediterranean world knew, knew about these back into Greek times and before. Okay. Um, sulfuric acid can be produced out of uh, multiple sulfate minerals. These got the alchemical name of vitriols. Um, and uh, commercial boric acid can be processed from borax by reacting the borax with hydrochloric acid. And hydrochloric acid um, has the, the alchemical name of um, aquamaria water of the sea because it could be processed by cooking salt just like I talked about hydrated lime you cook it mix it with water you get a chemical change when you cook salt mix it with water you get sulf you get hydrochloric acid mm. okay so um, hey and there's your arcana the Ooh. alchemical name yeah there you go anyhow so you have the uh, <laughs> being silly in this video so you have the uh, uh, potential for these to be known and used back in ancient times but there's not direct evidence of that happening that I'm aware of if you're aware of it I would love if you gave the video a thumbs up and then went down to the comment section and typed out where you've heard of it because I would love to know mm -hmm. if, if these were used in ancient mm -hmm. times 
They could have been in the Mediterranean region where they were for sure known. Um, but the surviving traditional tanning in Morocco uses urea and fermented pigeon guano. So I'm a little suspicious of them having actually been used. Probably a cost-benefit thing. But if you have more specific knowledge, I would love to know. Okay. So we have bucked and we have pickled our hide. We have done whatever we wanted to do with the hair and epidermis. We have degraded the ground substance. Now it's time to talk about the fat liquoring and the, and the uh, cross-linking, which is what actually converts it to leather. So we have done all of our prep work. We have skinned, flesh, bucked, and or pickled. We've gotten rid of all of that gooey, mucusy um, ground substance. Now we need to replace the function that that ground substance performed in a way that is compatible with having a permanent durable sheet of leather. Okay, and That's what both of these steps are about. So if you remember from the very first whiteboard that I had here, the ground substance, it cross-linked those fibers. It also provided a degree of lubricity between those fibers. Right, because it's mucousy, it tied them together, but it also lubricated their movement. You know, and that's why you could pull on your skin and it's stretchy, because the ground substance is lubricating the movement of the protein fibers. Okay, so we need to do two additional things to replace both of those functions if we want a full, durable, lasting sheet of leather. We return the lubricity with oils. But you're always going to be adding these oils at a stage where the leather is still wet. So we need water-soluble oils, and that's a problem, okay? So this is why we talk about this as fat liquoring rather than just oiling, okay? Because you need fats that can emulsify or even dissolve in water. And there's really two ways to do that. The first is with lecithin. Lecithin is a disaccharide phospholipid with a choline additive. Okay, That's a mouthful, you don't need to worry about that, but it's structurally similar to the phospholipids in your cell membranes for any bio students out there. Um, got a little bit more going on though. Uh, lecithin is produced in all animals and plants. It's everywhere. Okay, There are three good sources of lecithin for you as a leather tanning person. One is the health food store. You can just get dried, purified lecithin. And you can redissolve that. You can use it alone and or with other fats as an emulsifying agent. Okay? The second is brains. Brains are chock full of lecithin because it's such a fatty organ that you need a lot of lecithin for the brain cells to be able to manage their fat content. Mm -hmm. The same is true of egg yolk, which is the third source. Okay, so this is where dressing hides with brains come in. There are no tannins in brain. You'll sometimes hear people talking about like brain has enough tannin to tan the animal it came from. It's like there's no tannin in brain. It's a fat liquoring agent. Okay, um, and it is identical to egg yolk as a fat liquoring agent. And both are identical to going to the health food store and just buying some lecithin and mixing it with vegetable oil. Okay? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter which of those you get. It's all absolutely identical. It is the same chemistry, the same process. You're getting a water-soluble fat, getting it to soak through the currently wet hide so that the fats can coat the protein fibers and restore lubricity. Okay? The second way you can do that without lecithin is soap and oil. You can take any good soap and any good oil, any triglyceride-based oil. Don't use mineral oil. I, I would steer away from mineral oil. It's like I haven't used it. Uh, maybe as a final oil, yeah, but we, we want to stay predictable with the natural triglyceride oils with this. Um, you can use neat's foot oil. You can use vegetable oils. 
You could even use a heavy oil like a tallow or a lard, but you do need to know that the heavier the oil, the less fluffy the leather will be at the end. So if you're doing belt leather, sure, you could fat liquor with soap and lard. But if you want to do like a nice soft garment leather, you want to stick to something like Neat's Foot Oil or Olive Oil. The oils you need to stay away from are the drying oils. So your um, uh, safflower oil, walnut oil, um, uh, linen oil, linseed oil, right? Those drying oils that you can use to make paint will sol partially solidify inside of your leather. So those are not good for fat liquoring oils. But any of the like corn oil, olive oil, and neat's foot oil. In the modern world, those are the three I would stick to. They've all been used a lot. They're predictable. They don't go rancid readily. And they're not going to act as a drying oil and harden in your hide. So soap and oil is fat liquoring. Lecithin and other oils is fat liquoring. It's all the same. Mm -hmm. All you're doing is adding lubricity. The second thing we need to restore is a degree of cross liquor, uh, cross liquoring, a uh, degree of cross linking. So up to this point, everything we've been talking about is dressing the hide in preparation for tanning. Okay, That's the difference between hide dressing and hide tanning. Now, if you go through up to but don't fat liquor, you will get some version of vellum or rawhide. Okay, If you fat liquor, it can then be softened. So you can, you know, buck your hair, degrade the ground membrane, fat liquor, stretch it and get a nice soft, fluffy sheet of fluffy rawhide. But as soon as it gets wet, it's going to revert to a rawhide type condition. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you're doing that or you're doing parafleche or vellum or drum heads or rawhide or any of that, You've dressed the hide as far as you need to. You don't need to take it all the way to a tan skin. Mm -hmm. The cross-linking mordants are what make the transition from a dressed hide to a tanned hide. And this is where I want to take a moment and do a little chemical demonstration of what cross-linking is and how it alters the substances upon which it's acting. Several times now in this video, I've alluded to cross-linkers or cross-linking as something that happens in the chemistry of hide tanning. Now, I want to do a little demonstration here to show you a little bit more precisely what we're talking about. So if we take our hide and we think about the protein <coughs> fibers in it, they are long fibers. One protein fiber. It's actually cotton, but you get where I'm, where I'm going with this. And they're arranged sort of at random in a felt-like configuration throughout the hide. Okay, And now, if I pull on this in different directions, they can just freely move past each other. Okay, But if I come in and pick up the thing I dropped and add an additional molecule in here, which links them together. Okay. Now, anytime I pull any place, it moves the whole ensemble around. And if you have millions of these molecules linked in millions of locations with very strong cross-linkers, it will produce a very rigid ensemble, like bark tan leather. If you have weaker cross-linkers in less locations, it will remain softer. Um, and then in hide tanning, the cross linkers that we choose are also preservatives. So even if they don't tie two strands together, just by linking onto the protein fiber in various locations, they're coating it and preserving it. Okay. So I have two examples of cross linking. One a little bit distantly removed from hide tanning, but very dramatic, and that is the classic. <laughs> Elementary school demonstration of ladybug. Let me move you. There we go. Okay. <laughs> of some white school glue and borax. 
This is just a saturated solution of borax. I just poured hot water on a spoonful of borax. Nothing fancy. Now, White Elmer's glue are long strands, just like those pieces of string. And if I drop this into my borax solution, and then stick my fingers in and knead it around a little bit, you're going to see that very quickly this lump of school glue solidifies and this one is quite a bit wet but when they're just the right moisture content they make a nice little bouncy ball. A couple little bubbles of glue that I didn't quite get borax needed into there. I've made the mistake of doing this little demonstration and then squeezing it prematurely and squirting it all over my shirt. I was there, it was funny. Yeah, she was, and it was. <laughs> I might have had an audience for that too. Mm. Okay. So, the borax is the cross-linking agent. The glue are the long strands. And we have gone from sticky, runny glue to moderately bouncy lump of putty. Okay, that's the cross-linking effect. So borax is such a good cross-linker of Elmer School Glue that it will tie all of those long fibers together in so many places with such strength that we get this real rubbery material out of it, okay? Also, this is, the borax is water soluble, the school glue is water soluble, but this is no longer water soluble. No matter how long I leave it in that water, it is not going to dissolve, okay? So as your cross-linking increases, your molecular weight of the entities in your material increases and it loses solubility, okay? So this is also part of the chemical change and why tanning agents, some of them in some circumstances, can lead to a bit of um, water resistance in your leather. That right there. Now, borax has a lot of uses in working with hides, but it's not an effective cross-linker of protein. Okay, this is specific to the Elmer's glue and is just a particularly obvious visible demonstration. This is a little tub of Knox gelatin. Unflavored. And unflavored, yeah. And I mix this up at a standard hide glue recipe. There's a whole video on this channel on hide glue if you want to go look at it. But this is one packet of Knox gelatin in one third cup of boiling water. Stir until dissolved. Remove any goobers that refuse to dissolve standard high glue recipe and it's actually one of the strongest high glues you'll ever find. It is both the cheapest and the strongest high glue out there. Now, aluminum sulfate is one of the cross-linking agents that we do use in high tan. This reaction is not quite as obvious as the Elmer's glue reaction. Still exciting though. Because the um, the uh, protein molecules in here are broken down in short. Okay, If we could have full length collagen fibers, it would be more dramatic. And if this was a stronger cross-linker, it would be more dramatic. But this is a moderate to weak cross-linker and very short fibers. Okay, Again, this is the same material that we get when we cook collagen into high glue. Okay. But you can see I put this lump of the pure substance in there and we have a very similar reaction. Okay, It's not bouncy. I'm not going to try and pick it up. It's more of a, kind of a snotty consistency. But you can see that we do have a pretty profound chemical change as the um, aluminum ions cross-link with the um, 
residual bits of protein here in our gelatin. Okay. So this is now tanned gelatin. Don't try to make a shirt out of it. It ain't going to work. Let's go talk about these cross-linkers in more detail and the different types that we use in tanning. So as you saw there, when you add a cross-linking agent, it can have a fairly profound impact on the behavior of the material upon which it's acting, the material it is actively cross-linking. Okay? So in leather tanning, there's really four cross-linking agents that we use. Okay? These are also mordants. All of these are used in dyeing processes as well. A mordant is a material which sticks to the matrix upon which it's acting through ligand bonding. Okay? I'm not going to go into a whole deep dive on the chemistry of ligand bonding, but the one sentence version is you have an electrostatic attraction between the mordant and the fiber you're sticking it to. Okay? So when we're looking at the strongest cross-linking mordants that are used in, ta in tanning are the plant tannins. Some people consider these plant tannins or veg tan land leather to be the only truly tanned leather. Okay? I don't agree with that because it's just it's the top of a gradient, but everything in this in, on this list is doing functionally the same thing. Okay? These use hydrogen bonding interactions and basically the same ones that were present in the ground medium, the, the ground material, right? That we removed in earlier steps. So it's using the same chemical principles as the glycoproteins to stick to and then cross-link the leather fibers. Okay? And this is the strongest cross-linking agent. It has the strongest set of bonds and the strongest impact on the final properties of the material. Right? That's why veg tan leather is such a moldable, shapeable, um, carvable, durable, ha relatively hard material. Okay? because of the strength of these interactions. Okay? Next down, we have our chromium-3 and aluminum-3 ions. Aluminum can only make plus-3 ions. Chromium can make plus-3 and plus-6 ions. You do not want chromium plus-6 anywhere near your house. That is one of the nastiest, gnarliest, most disgusting carcinogens that we know. It is toxic. It is bad news bears. Okay. The chrome alum you buy for tanning is chromium-3, which is not as scary until you realize that when chromium-3 is further oxidized in the presence of water and oxygen, you get chrome-6. Mm. So your chrome-3 solution can spontaneously generate traces of chrome-6. Bad news. I will not chrome tan anything ever. Do not expect a chrome tan demo on this channel. You're not going to get it. <laughs> okay? And aluminum just kind of sits there and it does its aluminum thing, right? Um, aluminum alum, again, is, is, a, is an ingredient in some pickle recipes, right? It's not scary. Okay? has cautions. It'll solidify all of the junk in your septic tank. So, you know, there are still disposal cautions and it will still have the same impact on your skin as it does in the leather. So you don't want to stick your hands in it without gloves. But it's not chromium. <laughs> okay? So these two have the same property. They, they will stick to the leather fibers just by electrostatic attraction. They're positively charged. There are negatively charged regions of the leather fibers, and they just stick to them. Right? And they can stick to more than one, which provides a cross-linking impact. But while the plant tan tan tannins are big, long molecules and can reach out and grab over here and then grab way over here on two different fibers and span a gap, mm -hmm. these can only cross-link if the fibers are touching. So it's a weaker impact. Mm -hmm. okay? It's still a very good mordant. It is still a very good preservative. But 
it's much linker across linking just because of physical size. Plantanas are very high molecular weight um, polyphenolic molecules, right? Um, these are not. These are just single atoms with a charge. So your chromium and aluminum leathers are much lighter and fluffier than your veg tan leathers. Mm -hmm. okay. And then lastly, we have formaldehyde. Now, formaldehyde comes in two places. It is often used as a secondary mordant in chromium tan commercial processes. So they will buy commercial formaldehyde and use it, and it'll make chrome tanned leather a little sim more similar to veg tan than it otherwise would be. Okay? It's not used by itself in commercial processes, though. It is used by itself traditionally because partial combustion releases formaldehyde. Hmm. This is one of the reasons, formaldehyde is one of the reasons that when smoke pours onto your face, it burns your eyes. Partial combustion releases three things which burn your eyes. Acetic acid, you know, vinegar, the same acid of vinegar, formic acid, which is just one carbon less than acetic acid, and formaldehyde. So when you're sitting around a campfire and you get that burst of smoke in your face and it burns your eyes, it's because it's tanning your eyes with the formaldehyde content. This is where the smoke tanning comes in and smoking deer hides that have previously been dressed by fat liquoring in brains. Brains add lubricity, formaldehyde from partial combustion of punky wood in a smoky fire actually tans and finishes the process. Hmm. And this is why a you know brain dressed hide, you get it wet, it just reverts to rawhide. But if you smoke it, it doesn't. Hmm. Because while this is the weakest of all of the cross-linking agents, it's just good enough to preserve the fluffiness of the that you generated in your sheet of leather during the very hard work process of softening. So before ending this video, I just have a couple thoughts before I spit them all out. I would be very grateful if you gave the video a thumbs up so that the uh, algorithm knows that you're enjoying it. We'll show it to others. And then I just wanted to talk a little bit about you know looking at a piece and you know seeing how some of these things come together. So this is sort of a good case in point. This is a commercial, commercially tanned deer hide that I bought a couple years ago at a powwow. And we can see a few things about it. It was bucked, but it, in this region, it wasn't bucked for long enough and quite a bit of the hair remains. So they didn't get all of the hair out there. Uh, this is what happens when you don't leave it in those solutions quite long enough. Or, more likely in this case, it was in the solution in such a way that this part dried out. Mm. So the chemicals couldn't soak all the way in and, and do their job. The reason I say that is because in another area, you see these little patches where it's not as shiny? Mm -hmm. This is the epidermis sloughing off. Mm. So these areas were overbucked. <laughs> okay? So these were for overbucked, those were overbucked, and then the edges were underbucked. So, however they had this, I can't tell you what source of bacterial action or hydroxide they were using when they made this, but I can tell you some things about their process and where there's some flaws in the process. The tanning agent was undoubtedly vegetable in origin. This is a veg tan hide, and I can tell that by, by the, the texture. It's a fairly stiff hide, and you get that kind of leather sound mm -hmm. when you roll it around in your hands. That's pretty typical of veg tan. So, you know, you can see some things about how these different ideas fit together in the final product. But, regardless of what leather tanning process you're looking at, you're going to do all of these steps. Right? You're going to flesh. You're going to make a decision about how you want to treat the epidermis. That decision will dictate how you remove the ground material. Mm -hmm. okay? And then you will 
choose any fat liquoring solution, and they all do exactly the same thing, and a final preservative cross-leaking ligand. Okay, so those are the commonalities, fleshing and the four steps of tanning. And all of the tanning processes have some element of those in them. Sometimes you'll do two things at once. So the, the video that I did on alum tanning some deer hawk skins, that is both, that is cross-linking with the aluminum and pickling with the sulfuric acid generated by the alum in one step. Mm -hmm. So I pickled and tanned and then fat liquored is the last step. Mm -hmm. If you do a deer hide, you buck, then you fat liquor, and then you smoke and the cross-linking ligand is coming in at the very last step. Mm -hmm. So there's variations, you know. Is this leather fundamentally different from, you know, that I showed you that I held up here, from like a, a Moroccan veg tan leather? Not really, because tannic acid is the final tanning agent. Um, it was bucked and pickled. The, the traditional Moroccan process uses a combination of urine and hydrated lime for the bucking and then fermented dung for the pickling. I highly doubt that the uh, Amish farm which tanned this leather used pigeon dung for their pickle. Hmm. Highly doubt it. But it's basically the same end product because the function is there. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's one of the key things I wanted to get, get across in, in this video is the idea that we can demystify it and understand different processes and what's going on in terms of how they impact the four steps of tanning. Mm -hmm. Okay, So I hope that helps. I hope that it gives you some ideas and some understanding and a little bit of background. Um, and I really hope that you will subscribe and follow us along because I want to dive deeper into all of these and give you tutorials on all of the different steps that don't have chromium in them as we go through in the next few years of this channel. And it will take a few years to get through it all because some of them, like veg tan, that's pretty much the better part of a year just for one run. So mm -hmm. it, it will take some time. But I'll keep plugging away and I hope to see you next time here at Old Ways Rising Farm.